Good morning and welcome to a special one-off edition of Bracewell's Environmental Essentials webinar series. I'm Whit Swift, an attorney with Bracewell's Environmental Strategies Group, and this morning we're going to be talking about the latest developments in the Texas Title V program and how things are going to be changing with regard to the treatment of minor new source review permit by rule or PBR authorizations under the Texas Title V program. This is a special one-off webinar because the formal announcement from the TCEQ on this change did not come out until the end of May, and our May virtual seminar series was already fully booked and extended into early June. And we already have a July webinar planned relating to the Clean Water Act Section 401 rule and WOTUS litigation. And this information will be getting pretty stale by August, as we'll discuss. So here we are with a one-off. We've discussed this topic in the past. It's been going on since uh, 2018, and I talked about it, I believe, at least in one earlier webinar and at uh, one of our environmental seminars in Houston back in 2019. But again, at the end of May, the TCEQ announced the resolution of this issue and uh, its negotiations with EPA and established a new practice going forward for Title V permit holders in Texas with regard to PBRs, which gives us the reason to talk now. I'll try to be brief, but uh, I do want to address three main topics. First, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the background for this issue and why things are changing. Second, we'll talk about how things are going to change with regard to uh, PBRs in your Title V permit. And last, we'll talk about when those changes are going to occur. Okay, background. Um, PBRs are, as you know, minor new source review authorizations that Texas industry relies on heavily in making changes that are deemed insignificant from an air permitting perspective. Uh, they're, they're vital for the kind of operational flexibility changes that these complex, complex industrial sites need to make in order to keep operating and operate sort of a, a dynamic process. They're expedited authorizations and in most cases do not require prior approval, though some require contemporaneous or after the fact registration. Our Title V permits currently contain this table that lists the PBRs or their predecessors, the standard exemptions, and the version of the PBR or standard exemption that the site claims for authorization. Now in 2018, uh, the EPA administrator ruled on a bunch of long pending public petitions that have been filed on Texas Title V permits. EPA had denied many aspects of those petitions, but one area where the EPA administrator granted uh, a petition related to how the Texas Title V permits incorporated PBRs. Uh, the administrator found that the Texas Title V permits failed to adequately identify and assure compliance with the applicable requirements associated with those incorporated PBRs. And in addition to that order from the EPA administrator, we also had EPA Region 6 issuing objections to specific Title V permits based on these same concerns. So you had it coming from both ways, both uh, an order from the EPA administrator in response to a public petition after a permit had been issued, and you had EPA Region 6 issuing objections to permits based on public comment before those permits had been issued. Uh, following these orders, EPA and TCEQ engaged in an extended period of negotiations, and it was one where, um, uh, from our discussions, we, we learned that, that leadership at TCEQ was not inclined just to tell EPA to pound sand on this. And, you know, also, this is one where, you know, you had the EPA administrator issuing orders ruling on this. So it certainly wasn't a case that this was an example of the region going rogue, but rather you had orders being signed by, you know, President Trump's appointees that run the agency signing these orders, finding uh, deficiencies in the Texas permits. And if there was any sign that EPA uh, was going to or hope that EPA would retreat from its position. I think that was uh, clarified earlier this year when EPA Region 6 once again objected to a Texas Title V permit. 
based on a claim that the permit was deficient when it come, came to incorporating the PBRs. That January 2020 objection uh, cited confusion about which of the many PBRs and standard exemptions in the site's history still applied, whether they applied to insignificant emission units or to emission units that were not insignificant or whether they were site-wide and also concerns about the adequacy of any monitoring or record keeping that was necessary to show compliance with those PBR authorizations. And, and this was, again, it was the objection letter was is dated January 23rd, 2020, and it's for an uh, ExxonMobil Baytown chemical plant Title V permit. Uh, but negotiations were ongoing even at that time. And now uh, we have a resolution. And at the end of May, the TCQ uh, made this announcement and released a new Title V application form, form OP-PBR-SUP or PBRSUP. And uh, by completing this form PBR-SUP, an applicant should be able to complete the permit record in a way that'll satisfy EPA's concerns about the applicability of PBRs at the site, as well as how the applicant and the state can know that those PBRs are, uh, that the site is in compliance with the terms or conditions of those PBRs. So now let's talk about how things are actually going to be changing for permit holders. Uh, as I said, we've got this new form, form OP-PBR-SUP. And it, um, you'll see in the instructions for the forms that it includes a, a big table with a list of PBRs. It's important to note that that table uh, is the same list of PBRs that are already included in form OPREC-1. So, you don't have a new or different list of PBRs in this form. It's that same OPREC 1 form of authorizations. But uh, the form, the new PBR SUP form and how TCEQ is going to implement this, this uh, new mechanism divides PBRs into three groups. Uh, first is Group A. And Group A are those PBRs that require registration with the TCEQ. And these are deemed as uh, applying, because they require registration, they're deemed as applying to significant sources. And these are the ones where, when you are making a change or adding something new uh, under one of these PBRs, you submit a registration form and you receive a letter back from TCEQ with a unique registration number for that PBR claim. So that's that's group A of PBRs under this new system. And for these PBRs, the Title V application in this form PBR SUP will now identify the emission unit IDs associated with that PBR, as well as the specific registration number and date of registration for those PBR claims. You know, th these were, because they were already listed on OPREC 1, these Group A PBRs were already in the Title V permits, but what you're going to have here is you're going to have additional information relating to that specific registration that will be uh, part of your uh, Title V permit. Uh, second are Group B. And these are PBRs that do not require registration, but the TCEQ still deems them to apply to significant sources. And again, the, the there's not um, the group B of PBRs that are uh, identified or relevant for the Title V program is not expanding beyond what it already has been. Uh, the the table that's in this form PBR SUP is the same has the group a and group b pbrs and it's the same group that has already been in op rec one uh, for folks who've been dealing with pbrs and title five all along but this group b are pbrs that don't require registration but they still apply to what are deemed significant sources and uh, for these uh, you will you will be providing 
uh, specific emission unit ID uh, information for those sources that are authorized by those PBRs, as well as the version of the PBR that applies. So this is there's going to be new, you know, unit specific identification for these Group B PBRs. Uh, the third category, uh, these Group C PBRs that are in Table C of the new form. This is a, a third category of PBRs that are not in either Group A or Group B, and they have not been required to be listed in Title V applications previously. And these are PBRs that the TCEQ deems to be used for uh, insignificant sources, and they don't require registration. They've previously not been part of the Title V permitting process at all. Um, these will now be listed in the application on this table C of this form, and that list will be referenced in the statement of basis for the Title V permit, but this list of insignificant source PBRs is not going to be included in the Title V permit itself or in the statement of basis uh, for your permit. So you will have now in your application a list of the insignificant source PBRs claimed at your site, but this Group C of PBRs is not actually going to make it into the Title V permit itself. Uh, the last section of the form is uh, Table D, and, and this table is completely new and it's going to be a new part of the Title V permitting process here in Texas, and it relates to compliance demonstration for PBR requirements for the conditions of any PBRs that you're claiming. And uh, for the registered PBRs, that is the ones that are Group A or Table A PBRs, uh, there's, there's going to be no information on this Table D. The agency basically deems whatever monitoring or, or more likely record keeping is established in the PBR and then the PBR registration itself, that that is, is the required compliance demonstration for that registered PBR. It exists and is incorporated through the registration itself, and there's no additional uh, uh, work or explanation or paperwork that needs to be done for compliance demonstration for those Group A PBRs. This uh, Table D on the form relates to your Group B PBRs that are listed on Table B. So you've got, it will be those the unregistered PBRs that apply to significant sources so essentially, you know, any PBR claims that are for the PBRs that are in this long table that's at the beginning of the form where you have, do not have a registration, those PBRs are going to have to be addressed on Table D. And on this new Table D in the form, you're going to need to identify the record keeping or, or other compliance demonstration method that you use to demonstrate compliance with that claimed PBR. And again, this doesn't apply to those registered PBRs. It also doesn't apply to your group three insignificant source PBRs. They don't have to be addressed, but on if you do have any PBRs that are in this group B and on table B, then you're going to have to identify some kind of compliance demonstration method, record keeping or otherwise, on the form PBR SUP. And uh, this information that, inc that is included in Table D will become part of your application file, obviously, but it will not be an explicit part of the Title V permit. You know, the, these Title V permits already include general language that references the requirement to demonstrate compliance with PBR requirements. And so that language that was already in the permits um, 
uh, the agency deems, and I agree, is sufficient to to address you know what is being made more explicit here uh, in this table D and part of the application. Uh, I, I an important point here that uh, we've learned from talking with folks at the agency is that this table D compliance demonstration is not going to be a, a permit language negotiation point with the TCEQ. That is, I do not uh, expect and the agency doesn't plan to, to be evaluating or vetting the sufficiency of the monitoring requirements that you've set forth on your table D. I think if you leave it blank and you've got a, a group B PBR for which you have not identified any compliance demonstration method, you'll probably get some sort of deficiency notice and have to provide something. But I think as long as you have you know, completed that blank on the form and there is a listed compliance demonstration method that is part of your permit record, you're not going to have the TCQ uh, vetting or evaluating that or getting back to you uh, questioning the sufficiency of what you've set forth on table D. Uh, so, so that's the new form and that's going to become part of the Title V process here in Texas again. And it's been, it's, it's a way to uh, uh, expand and better explain how PBRs will apply at the site and what sources do and have more information in the permit record, if not explicitly in the permit, about what uh, the sources do to assure compliance with the terms and conditions of those PBR authorizations. Now let's talk about the timeline for rolling out this programmatic change. Uh, the key date is August 1st, 2020, uh, and the agency has announced that applications for initial permit issuance and renewal applications filed after that date will uh, need to complete this new form PBR SUP and have this information included. Uh, they will also require it for uh, applications for significant Title V permit revisions filed uh, after that date when the renewal date is more than two years away. So that's, those are the, the, the deadlines that the agency is going to use and the permit triggering events that the agency is going to use to gradually roll all of the regulated community into this new, uh, this new world of PBR referencing in Title V permits. So it'll, you know, it'll happen um, within five years for everybody and for many folks that have you know, anybody that's got a renew that hasn't just been renewed or has revisions coming up, it'll happen sooner than that. Uh, one thing that I think is worth pointing out, this isn't something that the that the agency has raised, but I think it is something that some folks will at least want to consider is whether uh, to go ahead and follow this process or submit this process with an application uh, sooner. Uh, even if it isn't necessarily triggered uh, by the deadlines set forth by the TCEQ. For example, if, if, you know, if you're at a source that may draw an EPA objection and you want to better bulletproof your application from a scenario where uh, a member of the public is going to raise this issue regarding your PBRs and put EPA in a position of potentially uh, objecting to your permit, you obviously would have the option to, to do so sooner. For example, I think the, mo the most likely scenario when you would do this would be if you had a significant revision and your renewal was less than two years away, well, then you have, you aren't required to do so, but you may want to include it with your significant, with that significant revision in order to avoid the potential for an objection there that could slow up the, the process of getting that revision issued because you're already going through again voluntarily there with the process that EPA has has blessed as far as uh, adding these PBRs and their compliance demonstration requirements to Texas Title V permits. So 
so that's the schedule. There's the change. That's the schedule for rolling it out. Um, I think that, you know, key thoughts here as far as uh, what this is changing for the program, you know, first and foremost, this is not should not and and I don't see how it would impact the utility of, of PBRs. You know, they are a very important mechanism for the regulated community and there's nothing in this new system that's been set up that is going to make it harder to claim a PBR um, or that will slow down or prevent you from using a PBR to make changes at your site. Um, and really, uh, you know, this doesn't give the regulated community any obligation that it did not already have. That is to have some form of record keeping or other compliance demonstration to show that it is operating in compliance with any conditions or requirements of a PBR authorization at the site. That, that was that was and is an existing obligation that we've all had under Chapter 106. And this is, uh, you know, taking steps to make that more explicit, I'd say. Uh, other key concept is, again, while there is going to be new information that will be provided to the agency about, uh, you know, record keeping that's being done to assure compliance with PBRs, it's not going to be a part of your Title V permitting process that you're negotiating that language with the TCEQ Air Permits Division. Um, and, you know, there, there's no doubt that, that completing this new form at PBR SUP is going to be some additional work. Uh, the first time that an application comes up when when you'll need to do this. Hopefully, so, you know, we'll have a fair amount of the information from past completion of OPREC 1 forms, but it's there's no doubt that it's going to be, uh, and certainly depending on the number of PBRs you've in standard exemptions that you have still authorizing things at your site, could be a pretty heavy lift to get this all squared away and clarified that first time. Um, but I think the agency's belief, and it, that should be true, is that after doing it the first time, that this form will be sort of an evergreen document that you will update and make changes to based on you know new PBR authorizations or claims at the site, or uh, you know incorporating changes so that that specific PBR authorizations are no longer relied on because those changes or those units are now authorized in an NSR permit somewhere. Um, but, you know, keeping it as an evergreen document after uh, the, the you know, potentially heavy lift of, of creating the document the first time, hopefully that won't be too burdensome uh, for the regulated community. Uh, that's what I had on this new PBR development. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you found this informative and helpful, and you can start looking forward to when this is going to be hitting you based on your, your permit renewal deadline or other plans that you have uh, going forward with regard to changes at your site. If you have any questions about this, uh, please feel free to send them to me at uh, the email address there on the slide, wit.swift at bracewell.com, or you can call me uh, and I'll give you my cell phone number, given that we're still uh, in this work at home environment. My, that number is 512-413-2900. And, and also, I hope you'll join us uh, next month for uh, our next regularly scheduled edition of the Environmental Essentials webinar series. A couple of my colleagues will be discussing these Clean Water Act developments relating both to uh, Clean Water Act Section 401 water quality certification rule and uh, a litigation update on the WOTUS issues and, and how these various uh, challenges to the navigable waters protection rule are playing out across the country. Uh, it should be an, an interesting and helpful topic for those of you that, that work water issues. Thanks again for joining me. Stay safe out there and have a great day.